The Tom Woods Show, episode 1055. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, it's that time of year again. This holiday, give Harry's and give handsome. Get your holiday shopping done early and take advantage of free shipping. To get a limited edition holiday shave set while supplies last, go to harrys.com slash woods right now. That's harrys.com slash woods. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here. We're talking about the Vietnam War today. There's been a lot of discussion about it in recent months and weeks because of the multi-part PBS special that has the name Ken Burns on it. And I thought we would talk to Gareth Porter, who has another perspective on the Vietnam War. Gareth Porter holds a Ph.D. in Southeast Asian Studies from Cornell University. He's the author of numerous books, including Perils of Dominance, Imbalance of Power, and the Road to War in Vietnam. He was active as a Vietnam specialist and anti-war activist during the Vietnam War, serving as Saigon Bureau Chief for Dispatch News Service International from 1970 to 1971, and later as co-director of the Indochina Resource Center. He's taught at numerous universities, and he joins us today. Gareth Porter, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much, Tom. Glad to be on. The idea for this episode came from our friend Gene Epstein, who is now happily retired from Barron's, and he had commissioned a review from you, and it was all the timing because of his retirement didn't quite work out, but he thought maybe this could be the genesis of a great episode between the two of us. So that's what we're doing. I have not seen this Ken Burns or who knows who's really in charge of its series on the Vietnam War, (laughs) just because I watch so little TV, I realized the other day. But it doesn't surprise me that even if it might be critical about certain aspects of how the war went or turned out or some decisions that were made along the way, a lot of the basic premises that are guiding the series uh, seem to be just ripped out of the establishment playbook and and you were just not having it and in particular in your book your own book perils of dominance you offer some rather provocative corrections to the record now i what i'd like to start with is the thing that i believed in for a while i believed in even after it didn't happen i still believed in it namely the domino theory i was a I mean, I was barely, I was born in 1972, so I, I, in the 1980s, I was like a young Republican, and I read <laughs> Rich, I read Richard Nixon's book, No More Vietnams, which mm-hmm. I'm sure you read at some point, and to me, and, I, and I, I looked at it, I'm sure. Okay, all right. Well, I read that because I felt like as a good young Republican, I've got to read this book, absorb it, and repeat the talking points in it, and that thing, he did talk about the domino theory, that one country goes communist, then all of Southeast Asia goes communist, and Nixon's retort to everybody who questioned that was always, well, the dominoes believed it. (laughs) What is your response to that whole theory? Well, I'm glad you've asked that question, because it is such a huge shadow, if you will, over the understanding of people of of several generations now, of the dynamics of you know that that surrounded the Vietnam, the U.S. war in Vietnam, um, and and uh, you know it's a very good question. What about the dominoes? I mean, of course, the domino in chief in regard to this whole question was Lee Kuan Yew and Singapore, because they're the ones who talked about this incessantly. Um, and the reality is that Singapore, uh, you know, was very successful in part because of foreign investment that came in particularly from Japan, and this was true of the rest of the dominoes in Southeast Asia, uh, both during the Vietnam War and particularly later, the the Japanese continued to uh, invest in uh, the non-communist governments, uh, not governments, but but, uh, countries and economies of Southeast Asia. And, And that capital was instrumental in then bringing about uh, a lot of economic growth in the region. But that had nothing to do with the U.S. intervention in Vietnam, because had the United States chosen to negotiate in 1962, 63, 64, or 65, rather than to intervene militarily, uh, the the, uh, growth in the region probably would have been even more spectacular. Because there's no question uh, in my mind that the uh, reunification of, of Vietnam would have taken place on a much slower schedule than it actually did take place eventually after 1975. 
that that North Vietnam would have been prepared to live with a non-communist, uh, although uh, certainly not anti-communist, South Vietnam for several years, and that uh, therefore uh, th- this whole idea that it was only the U.S. war that allowed the dominoes to prosper is part of the uh, fiction that surrounds the entire history of the Vietnam War. So that that's at least one part of it. Now, you know, I, I also go back into the history of the domino theory, back to the Eisenhower administration, when it was first, it first became a household word in the United States, because uh, Ike used it in a press conference in uh, the spring of 1954, saying that um, the United States was, uh, was not going to allow uh, Vietnam to go under because of the tin and tungsten in Southeast Asia and because of the uh, fact that, that uh, if, if it didn't, the dominoes would all topple. Uh, we know now uh, that, in fact, Eisenhower and his closest uh, advisors did not really believe that. In fact, they had abandoned that in 1953 uh, or even earlier because of the uh, changes that had been taking place in Southeast Asia, the, the communist movements that had seemed so dangerous and on the march in the late 1940s had burned out by 1950, 51, 52. And by 1953, Eisenhower had changed his mind about the danger of, of a communist takeover in the region and believed that it was not going to happen and the United States should not intervene militarily in Indochina. Uh, and, and so that, in a nutshell, is the background of this whole, this whole, uh, uh, really uh, a, a myth that has perpet- been perpetuated uh, by one government after another, one administration after another, to justify uh, the U.S. role in South Vietnam. And it was always an instrumental idea rather than a true belief. That, that's what I document in my book. So if that's not the explanation, if it's not the domino theory, then we sometimes hear, I mean, there could be humanitarian explanations, there could be this, the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization obligated us to stand by our friend, and if we don't stand by our friends, then we'll get a bad reputation in the world, countries will be less likely to want to be our friends, they'll choose the wrong side in the Cold War. What about any of that stuff? Well, I'm glad you've asked about that, too. The the idea that it was the Southeast Asia Treaty obligation of the United States that that really forced the U.S. hand to intervene in South Vietnam. This, of course, was an argument that was made by Secretary of State Dean Rusk, a name that people may not have heard for a while, but uh, who was who was the guy who was uh, constantly uh, reiterating these legal moral arguments for for the U.S. intervention. The reality, again, historically, is that Eisenhower uh, was uh, was asked by some of his more uh, warlike advisors in 1950, 1955-56 uh, to agree uh, to an obligation to the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization before it was signed, I'm talking about, in 1956. Um, he, he was asked by his advisors to, uh, to uh, go ahead and, and agree the United States would intervene if there were a communist uprising in South Vietnam that required U.S. military assistance. And he refused to do it. The only circumstances under which uh, he agreed to intervene militarily was a, uh, a North Vietnamese invasion of the South. And therefore, uh, you know, he, he was not uh, he was not willing to go along with the idea that you are now uh, suggesting is, in fact, in the the CETO treaty. Uh, it, it was never one that obligated the United States to intervene militarily, except in the case of a uh, crossing the border, a, a classical invasion by foreign foreign army. Now that that invasion did ultimately happen. But the United States uh, had already intervened militarily before it did happen. Uh, so it was it was really, uh, you know, the, the Vietnam War began as an indigenous South Vietnamese communist uh, uprising uh, for several years. And, and the United States began its intervention, obviously, uh, well before uh, 
the North Vietnamese military became uh, seriously involved in the South. So again, it's really a major myth that has never been cleared up uh, in the uh, discussion and in, in the discourse on the war uh, in the United States over several generations now. Well, I think it may be repeated because people are trying to look for some explanation for why the U.S. got in. And if none of these work, then what is the real explanation? I mean, I don't even I don't believe it's tin and tungsten either. It's not tin and tungsten, clearly. I mean, I don't think very many people now really believe in that, although perhaps there's a, a shadow still over people's understanding about about that. But no, I mean, the real reason is is very deep in the bureaucratic interests of the Pentagon, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the, the military services, and other uh, elements of the uh, the war bureaucracy in the United States. Wait a minute, hold on a minute. Are you suggesting that the military establishment has interests of its own <laughs> apart from the well-being of the American public? That's exactly what I'm suggesting. In How fact, about that? Yeah, uh, and, and uh, very. Let, let me begin with a uh, a bit of history that I did not capture in my book because I didn't find out about it until after the book was published. But um, there is a, a, a doctoral dissertation uh, that was written in the late 1970s, um, and the the author of of the dissertation interviewed. Uh, more than one member, I believe he interviewed three of the four uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, during the uh, decision-making process leading up to the U.S. invasion in 1965. Uh, and those then uh, members of the Joint Chiefs of Staff told the researcher that that they believed that they would stand to get a, a better a deal in the budget in 1961, 61, 62, and beyond, uh, get a get a higher level of military appropriations if there were U.S. troops in South Vietnam, and therefore, this was uh, they they acknowledged this was a major consideration in their calling on John F. Kennedy to send U.S. combat troops to South Vietnam in late. 1961. Well, that wasn't even late 61. They were starting this in mid-1961. Uh, they continued to press for this for the next six months, and ultimately, Kennedy made a compromise with the military, the Pentagon, and his other advisors, all of whom were calling on him to agree to send combat troops in uh, November 1961, and he agreed not for combat troops, but for advisors, quote-unquote. And of course, uh, most people now are perhaps aware that those advisors were actually, in the case of the Air Force, were, were you know, carrying out combat operations. So it was a distinction without a real difference in many cases. What is the role of the U.S. presidents in any of this? Isn't it weird that I even have to ask you that question? No, it's not weird. I mean, uh, in, in a sense, uh, this, the, the dominant understanding, I would say the almost universal understanding of how the United States goes to war, not not just on the part of of people who are readers of books, but of uh, the the authors of history uh, hi histories of the Vietnam War have believed, I think, almost religiously that it, it is the president who decides this, and his advisors are merely there to give him their views. Well, the the political reality is that no president can ever make a decision about going to war without taking into account the views of uh, particularly the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the Secretary of Defense, and if the Secretary of State and the head of the CIA and his national security advisor are all lined up on the same side and want to go to war, then it is doubly, triply, and quadruply uh, difficult for a president to defy them and simply say, no, I'm not going to do it. And that was the case for both John F. Kennedy and Lyndon B. Johnson. They were both uh, confronted with a phalanx of a united set of advisors who were all calling on them to go to war. In the case of Kennedy, it was a matter of sending combat troops to South Vietnam uh, in 1961. And in the case of Johnson, it was really to initiate a an air war against North Vietnam, which 
Johnson knew perfectly well, and so did his advisors, was an introduction to a ground war that would certainly follow. Because once you sent, uh, once you began the war against North Vietnam, uh, you were going to have to protect your uh, troops in the South. You're going to have to protect uh, the the assets they already had there from retaliation, and that's exactly what happened. So, uh, the the reality is, and this is what I talk about it in some detail in my book, that both uh, John F. Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson were very reluctant to go to war, and in some ways. Johnson was even more determined to avoid war than John F. Kennedy, although that's not his his uh, reputation historically. But I show uh, in a variety of ways that, that Johnson really was very much opposed to this. But he was politically afraid that his own advisors would turn against him and essentially go to the press, or go to Congress, and blame him for the loss of South Vietnam and he was deathly afraid of, of the consequences of that politically. He was not able to withstand the pressure. Uh, John F. Kennedy, we're not sure what he would have done, of course, unfortunately. But uh, he, he did a lot, uh, as I show in my book, to undermine his own administration's policy once he realized that he'd made a big mistake in late 19, 1961 and tried to get the, uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff to agree to a three-year timetable for pulling out all U.S. troops. Um, that was perhaps a, a kind of wishy-washy approach to it. Instead of saying, we are going to pull out, he felt that he needed to get their approval. And that, of course, never happened before he was shot down. More with Gareth Porter after we thank our sponsor. Friends, this holiday season, think long and hard about the well-being of your gift recipients and don't give gifts that are just going to clutter their houses. Give something practical that has a personal twist. That's what I did with my friend Michael Malice, who was voted the number one guest on this show. I gave him a Harry's Shave Set. I love the closeness of the shave, and Michael, being an ego case, loves his initials engraved on the razor handle. So this holiday, take advantage of Harry's custom and limited edition shaving sets that make perfect gifts. They come with German-engineered five-blade cartridges that provide a close, comfortable shave, a foaming shave gel that smells amazing, special limited edition winter chrome and emerald green handles, and you can personalize it with engraving. Sets come ready to gift in beautifully designed gift boxes. Gift sets start at just 10 smackers. They have great stocking stuffers. Even get something for yourself with Harry's. And as a special offer for listeners of this show, we partnered with Harry's to give you $5 off your order when you go to harrys.com woods. This offer is only available for the holidays. This holiday, give Harry's and give handsome. Get your holiday shopping done early and take advantage of free shipping. To get a limited edition holiday shave set while supplies last, go to harrys.com slash woods right now. That's harrys.com slash woods. I want to skip ahead. I want to use the host's privilege to skip ahead uh, a bit um, idiosyncratically to something that's interesting to me. And then I want to get back to things like the the, the real nature of the way the war was waged, because that's the real question. I mean, was it deliberately targeting civilians? That's the thing that still divides people uh, also. But I want to move on to the, the Cambodian incursion of 1970, because I remember, again, as a young Republican, reading about this after the fact and thinking, all right, this is not an ideal situation, but here's here's what's going on. You've got a weak, neutral Cambodia. The communists are exploiting the weakness of, of Cambodia to carry on the war effort, and then they can find sanctuary in neutral Cambodia. And Nixon at least claimed that the Hague Convention authorized intervention in a case where, like this where there was a country that was too weak to do anything about another country exploiting its, its neutrality like this. And so he went in and tried to clear out these sanctuaries. And I felt like, well, that just seems only right. If you're going to be waging the war, you ought to be able to clear out those sanctuaries. Now, I, I don't favor the war anymore, but I have to, I'm going to be honest with you. There's still 7.3% of me that <laughs> kind of feels like if I'm in that situation, I'm clearing out those sanctuaries. So what's wrong with that? Well, I mean, I think that there's a great deal of logic to, to that position. Obviously, once you're in a war, then you have to act in such a way as to take full advantage of, of everything you can to win the war. And, and uh, you know, obviously, there, there were communist troops in uh, Cambodia. They had taken refuge from U.S. bombing in South Vietnam, uh, the bombing that began in 1965 and continued uh, 
right up until uh, 1970, uh, 1973, uh, although it was uh, not not as heavy apparently in the in the final years as it was earlier. Uh, and that bombing, which, by the way, that goes to your the question that you intended to ask later, but we'll go into that further, uh, was so heavy that it was really impossible for uh, for Viet Cong troops to avoid, uh, you know, the 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 U.S. Uh, massacring them uh, with B-52s, except by uh, crossing the border into Cambodia, where there was heavy. Uh, cover uh, with with uh, you know triple canopy for us, um, and so that was the uh, the situation that existed in 1970. And and uh, the problem is not so much the legality of the, of that in a narrow sense. Uh, uh, you know that's that's not the issue. The issue is the larger question of whether the United States had any business getting into the war in the first place. Yeah, right. And, and you know, that, that is, you know, the, the problem with saying that, what, you know, th- there was a justification for going into Cambodia. Uh, the, the, the reality is, historically, that, uh, that Sihanouk was powerless, as, as you indicated, and, and everybody knew that. Uh, he was powerless against the the communists, and he was powerless against the United States. Uh, both sides could do whatever they wanted in that part of Cambodia because he had no control over it. But uh, th- the fact is that the United States uh, changed all that in 1970 when they got rid of Sihanouk and put in his place a a pro uh, U.S. Uh, anti-communist regime, which was totally feckless, had no public had, had no popular support and which then cleared the way for the Khmer Rouge to rise to power in Cambodia. And so if you want to look at the actual consequences of the U.S. intervention in Cambodia, not just the bombing, but the, the, the regime change, which the U.S. clearly engineered, uh, it would not have taken place without the CIA's permission, although this has never been proven. I mean, the, the, the uh, circumstantial evidence is extremely powerful here. Uh, and, and so the U.S. bears responsibility for everything that happened in Cambodia after that, which, as, every, as all of your listeners know, include the, uh, the deaths of a very large percentage of the, of the Cambodian population, of a, of a significant percentage of that population. And, and so the Khmer Rouge were, of course, the ones who are immediately responsible, but in the larger historical perspective, the United States has to bear full responsibility for everything that happened because uh, Cambodia was living in peace before the Vietnam War began. All right, let's go back to the the Vietnam War and, the, and again, the way it was fought, because there's been some controversy. Now I can't remember the name of the book, but a few years ago, a book came out, very controversial, making the the case that it was not anomalous when you hear a story like the My Lai Massacre, for example. It was not anomalous that this sort of thing happened. It was – this was the way the war was waged. And what you hear on this are differing responses from veterans of the war. You have some veterans who say it was horrible and uh, it's just unspeakable what I saw and what I was a part of. And you got other veterans saying, how dare you impugn my character? Right. How do we who weren't there sort through these different testimonies? Well, the book you're referring to, I'm sure, is the one by Nick Terse. Yes, that's right. Who, who did, yes, he spent a, a great amount of time, I mean, years, really researching this. And and it is very well documented. I have no doubt that he has captured the essence of the situation in his book. Um, I actually did some research on this many years ago as well. I asked for and received the full text of the uh, crucial document, policy document, which was issued by Westmoreland's command, General uh, uh, Westmoreland, the, the commander of the U.S. Uh, forces in uh, South Vietnam in 1965, uh, 64, 65, and, and beyond, um, uh, that this MACV, as they called it, the Military Assistance Command Vietnam Directive, it is the crucial piece of evidence that the the Peers Commission, uh, some of your listeners may not be familiar, the Peers Commission was created by the U.S. Army to uh, investigate uh, the cover-up of the My Lai Massacre um, after it was reported by Cy Hirsch. Uh, 
uh, and made into a major issue in the United States. And the Peers Commission, um, you know, identified several uh, officers and uh, listed men who they found to be to have been guilty of um, having covered up or participated in the My Lai massacre. But what the Peers Commission did not do was to investigate uh, the chain of command and uh, and the responsibility of various levels of the chain of command all the way up to Westmoreland himself. And and what I discovered in my research is that Peers was um, someone who was clearly under the command, was still under the command of Westmoreland and was hoping uh, for a plum uh, command position in South Korea, the, to be the commander of U.S. troops in South Korea. And uh, he was clearly told that he would get that plum assignment only if he did the right thing in his, uh, in his investigation. And so, very notably, he did not carry on an investigation above the level of the uh, uh the commander who was in charge in the in the region uh and and so he he basically he went beyond that to uh essentially uh uh give a uh, a clean slate to a uh, clean bill of health i should say to westmoreland and and tried to to suggest that westmoreland's directives actually required that us forces respect uh, civilians and not do anything to kill civilians uh, unnecessarily uh, had very careful uh, uh, carefully uh, defined rules that uh, rules of engagement that would uh, uh, protect civilians from from harm the reality is if you look at the full text of that macv directive in 1965 you find that uh, those those uh, uh, rules of engagement that were cited by the Pierce Commission were only for those areas which were under either not under uh, the control of the South Vietnamese government or had been only for short term under the control of the Viet Cong. They were not to apply to areas that were long term Viet Cong strongholds. In other words, it was clearly uh, understood by the command and by the commanders that in those areas, the population had to get out. If they didn't get out, they were considered to be the enemy. And that is exactly what Nick Terse says in his book. And that is the problem that has never been addressed really by historians, except for Nick, uh, in, the, um, in the discourse on the Vietnam War. I want to just share with you, if I may, just from my own recollection, one of my proudest moments on this podcast. And I, I'm... I, I think it's a very underrated moment. I thought it would get more of a response than it did. But I had Pat Buchanan on the show. And for a lot of reasons, I know a lot of people don't like Pat Buchanan. I like him. And I just think he's got some blind spots on things. Now, on Vietnam, there's ain't no way I'm going to persuade Pat Buchanan, <laughs> who was in the Nixon White House, about you know, the, the wrongness of that. Right. But what I did say to him, and I'm curious just to get your visceral response to what I said. I, at one point, I said, all right. Let's think this through. Let's imagine from the point of view of a Burkean style conservative, let's evaluate the Vietnam War. Now, it, maybe we can agree that it would be a tragedy for Vietnam to go communist. But the thing about conservatism is that we have a limited scope of what we of what our concerns are. Like my main concern is my family and friends and then my town and then my state and then my country and then Vietnam. I mean, of course I want them to do well, mm -hmm. but I have a, a series of concentric circles and Vietnam is way, way on the outer edge. So while we are going there, presumably to make those people better off, meanwhile, our own country is going through tremendous turmoil. There's a cultural revolution going on in large part caused by the war itself, causing the kind of domestic turmoil that you no doubt oppose on many levels. Meanwhile, there's an enormous expenditure of resources, which you also generally oppose, that throws the budget out of whack, that leads to monetary policy that results in the 1970s stagflation. And, and you know what? Vietnam goes communist anyway. Even after all that, they went communist anyway. And the result was, yes, I wouldn't want to live in Vietnam at that time. But the, that was the same outcome. We could have had that outcome without the expenditure of the resources, without 
maybe some of the turmoil society went through. In other words, you could have avoided a whole lot of terrible consequences from your own point of view, not to mention the unspeakable number of civilian deaths that were caused, the horrors that were rained from the sky. How can you say on balance that maybe it wouldn't have been, would have been better just not to do it in the first place? And in his response... I got a glimmer of a suggestion that maybe I might actually have been right, and I thought, that is the biggest coup I've ever had on this show. Well, I'm not surprised that you did, you did get that glimmer, because, of course, I mean, as a, as a paleoconservative, uh, he, I think viscerally, uh, certainly in his later years, uh, is opposed to the, exactly the kind of war that Vietnam represented. I mean, that is the, you know, the absolute uh, perfect example of the kind of war that he has continued to oppose. Uh, so, so I think that your argument certainly must have touched some kind of chord with him, even though he must have been reluctant to acknowledge that. Yes, yes, he was. Now, uh, but let me ask you this: this is this is the key thing to me is that it's. Because the Cold War is is uh, presented to us as this unique period of of unusual and extraordinary peril, we act as if the wars or the hot and the cold and hot wars of of that time are not comparable to wars that have occurred since then. That it's not it's not right to compare the war in Iraq with because we needed the war we needed Vietnam we need I mean in other words this is the way a conservative would argue a paleocon would argue we may have needed some of these hot wars that we had uh, during you know from from the 1950s up through 1990 we may have needed some of those now the ones we have now are totally elective and we're against those but with the with the Soviet threat we so they make it seem as if the paradigm is completely different. So therefore, comparisons are invalid. Yes, that, that, that I think that's a fair statement to make about the discourse on on America's history of of wars, both both during the Cold War and after. And, and I think that's fundamentally wrong. I agree with you that that what we really need to do is to examine. This, it, we need a totally different paradigm, and I think the paradigm has to be what are the real interests of the United States and what are the real interests that have pushed the United States into these wars. And, and, and you asked the right question earlier in the conversation, and I didn't really spend uh, very much time in answering that. And, and so let me go back to that question, because, you know, in the case of Vietnam, I, I indicated that it was uh, indeed the bureaucratic interests of the military and the Joint, the joint Chiefs of Staff and the Pentagon that were really primarily responsible for this. And I indicated that, that you know, the Joint Chiefs uh, told this researcher uh, that, that, uh, that they believed they would get more money out of Congress by having troops in South Vietnam. It was that level of, of narrow bureaucratic self-interest that pushed them into making a fateful decision that was not in the interest of the United States. And I think that that's... A, you know, there were other things as well. I, I, in my book, I talk about the fact that that uh, it was not the, uh, the domino uh, fear, fear of falling dominoes. They knew because the CIA told them over and over again in the 1950s and right up until uh, the early 19 in the early 1960s that there was not going to be uh, falling dominoes all over Southeast Asia. At worst, it was going to be Cambodia and Laos that would follow South Vietnam. Uh, into the communist uh, uh, the, the communist orbit, if you will, uh, but not the rest of Southeast Asia. That wasn't going to happen. What was likely to happen, they were told by the CIA, is that that Malaysia, the Philippines, Thailand will go neutralist, and they will not participate in a cold war against China, and that was what was unacceptable not just to the Joint Chiefs of Staff, but to the civilians who were at the Pentagon, in the State Department, the hawks that were supporting this war, they wanted to continue to have all those military bases surrounding uh, China. Uh, they wanted to have a, a phalanx of anti-communist allies throughout Northeast Asia and Southeast Asia that we could cite to support our continued a uh, uh, hostile policy toward China. Uh, of course, in the end, we gave it up because who did it? It was Nixon and Kissinger. They had an opening to China and ended the Cold War against China on their own. But uh, in 1964, 65, this was what was on the minds of the people who finally said, yes, we're going to go to war.
And so, you know, this was, this represented uh, a desire to continue the status quo in the Far East because it was good for the bottom line. It was good for the justification of U.S. military bases, of the alliances, of all of the money that, that went into that and the jobs that went into that and the prestige. All those things were on the line and they were unwilling to give it up. And I, let me just add that that, is, that paradigm can be applied, in my view, to every single one of the wars that we have fought in the post-Cold War uh, uh, period, that starting with the uh, the first Gulf War, which was a war that was, you know, really uh, started by uh, Dick Cheney, who was then uh, Secretary of Defense in the George H. W. Bush administration, in order to find a, a post Cold War rationale to replace the Soviet Union, which was no longer available. Well, as we wrap up, I, I want to share, I guess, my main reason for being pessimistic, and I don't like being pessimistic. It's not my natural temperament, and maybe you can lift me out of it, or maybe you're going to make me more pessimistic. I don't know, but when I think about, let's say, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, okay, well, they want probably to increase their budget just like any other part of the government, but right. But when the Fish and Wildlife Service asks for a budget increase, you don't have this response among the general public that the Fish and Wildlife Service keep us safe, and they are sacrificially offering themselves for in the defense of our way of life. They don't have that special advantage, whereas the military interests, they have that advantage. I mean, we stand up for soldiers on the airplane and, you know, soldiers get a 10 percent discount at the ice cream parlor and things like that. It has suffused American society. And it is very hard, therefore, to say to people, just because somebody is calling for military intervention does not mean that, therefore, the correct patriotic moral approach is for you to stand up and salute and then disparage everybody who doesn't. There's something much more venal and crude going on here. It seems impossible to crack through. And and I feel like the, the military interests, the military industrial complex must get a good chuckle out of this, how easy it is to snooker people because you just get them waving the flag and they think they're doing something that's they've been taught to do as kids and their daddy taught them to do, which was to back the military. How do you crack through that? Well, I mean, you're absolutely right, Tom. I mean, that is the essence of the political problem that we have with American wars. I, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. And I think that the, you know, that goes back to, um, you know, several decades of misinformation passed on by the uh, news media, of course, but, uh, but I think historians, uh, those people who are the supposedly uh, out to, to capture the truth and to, to uh, relay it to people who are most concerned about understanding the truth, uh, have to bear uh, a huge amount of blame here for failing to put together an accurate picture of the past. Uh, and so we have this paradigm that, as, as you suggest, has never been cracked, really, uh, that, that what's, what's really um, uh, at stake here is, a, uh, is an honorable set of instit military institutions without distinguishing between those people who have made sacrifices and who, who have to be honored uh, for their sacrifices, uh, but, but at the same time have been sent to war by people who have been motivated by uh, whether they acknowledge it or not. And, and this is, you know, I think this is a question that I cannot really answer personally, the extent to which they understand that they have their own organizational and personal interest at stake. These are these are people who are divorced from the interests of uh, both the American people and from the interests of the rank and file troops who are sent to war. And, and that is, in my view, the essence of this problem. And so we have to we, we have to create a new paradigm that makes this distinction clear and that that shows that the that the elite, the national security elite, which is profiting not just in terms of the corporate uh, uh, allies of the Pentagon and, and the, uh, the military uh, uh, services, but the, the uh, bureaucratic uh, officials themselves, the, the, the people who stand atop these most powerful bureaucracies the world has ever known, they profit personally and organizationally from this.
And that point has to be driven home. I'm, I'm trying to uh, find a way to publish a book that will make this point. <clears throat> and that's, uh, that's my challenge in the coming weeks and, and months and years. But I, I think that that's the problem that we face. No one really understands that. Even people who are anti-war don't understand it. Well, your book is called Perils of Dominance, Imbalance of Power and the Road to War in Vietnam. Uh, I'm going to link to that, of course, at the show notes page, tomwoods.com slash 1055. Do you have a website I can direct people to? Well, I'm ashamed to say that I don't, Tom. I should. Uh, and I've, I've been uh, thinking about uh, how to do that, and I just haven't pulled the trigger on it yet. But, uh, but I, I'm going to be doing so in the future. But, but I'm published uh, in a number of places, including the American Conservative, Truth Out, and uh, the Consortium News. Uh, those are perhaps the three places that I've published published in the most in in the last couple of years. All right, I'll see if I can find a Gareth Porter archive over there, and uh, and I'll link to that on the show notes page as well. Well, thanks for your time today. I mean, obviously, there's a lot that could be discussed here, but I just wanted to get some basic. Just this short conversation is probably more and better information than anybody's likely to find anywhere on this. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Well, I thank you for your interest. Thanks thanks so much for having me on, Tom. All right, that is our episode for today. I have no further commentary for you, so I'm just going to say thanks so much for listening. If you're not subscribing to The Tom Woods Show, I don't know what to tell you. You get something awesome like this every single weekday. So check out the links. TomWoods.com slash episodes has every single episode we've ever done. All 1,055 of them, plus links to subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, or any podcatcher you like. Thanks for listening. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.